Good morning, everybody. Uh, let us rejoice and be glad in today, because today is the day that the Lord has made. It is a wonderful time to be able to celebrate with everybody um, the Sunday after Easter. And for those of you who were not aware, the church calendar um, set forth centuries ago actually has this Sunday and the next few Sundays as being a full celebration of Easter. Um, Easter is actually a 50-day season in the church calendar. So are you using today to continue to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ? We must remember to always celebrate the resurrection, not just every Sunday, but every single day as a Christian, especially the first 50 days following Easter. Now, um, today we're going to preach through 1 Corinthians 16, but there are a couple of items that I want to quick make sure that I put out there before um, I preach, though I'm going to try to cover some of these items a little more fully in the sermon. So, as has been asked, uh, we can continue to give to the church through um, writing checks if you are someone who needs to write every week to stay in that rhythm. Um, mail them to the church and I'll get them to the proper person. Um, or you can write once a month or you can wait till everything's over. How that happens is for you. But what we cannot forget to do is to continue to support the missionaries at Grace Bible Church. And I posted on Grace Bible Church's Facebook page a link to all the missionaries that we support. So be sure to go there and support them. Um, I want to specifically give a recommendation to reach out personally to Pregnancy Resource Center in Rushville because I know that they've been affected by having to change and alter their hours and figure out how they can give services. They also canceled their uh, fundraiser that's going to come up in the end of May, start of June as a 5K uh, that I'm going to greatly miss. Um, so just contact them, reach out to different missionary agencies, try to ask how can we help you continue the mission that God has laid upon your heart. And the next thing too is I want to just make sure that we as a body of believers are reaching out right now to all the people in the educational system, all the teachers that have just heard um, Governor Pritzker announce that the school year is not going to be finished in person, but is going to be finished through online classes and stuff like that. So please make sure to reach out to the administrators, the teachers, the psychologists, the, the school faculty, and the counselors, everyone in that aspect. Reach out to them and encourage them. Um, and we're going to have to wait till Tuesday to see if sports have been canceled or if that's going to change. Um, but just overall, this is Grace Bible Church just reminding everybody, let's be the body of Christ at this time, encouraging one another during this very different and unique time. Only a few people living were alive during the 1918 um, pandemic of that time. So this is just new for a lot of people in this world in a completely different way than anyone anticipated. But the gospel hasn't stopped the good news of Jesus Christ is true yesterday, today, and forever. And in fact, we feel it all the more. Now, before I jump into chapter 16, let's open up in a word of prayer because as we know all the more right now, Jesus is so needed and we need his presence. And I want to advise everyone who's at home with your family to hold each other's hands and to actually pause and pray just like it was an ordinary church service, um, and just stay united in prayer. So, Heavenly Father, we give this next moment of time to you as we know that everything that we have, every moment of time, should be submitted to you. We recognize fully your authority over today and ask that we would celebrate you and that we would allow the atmosphere of the resurrection celebration from last week to continue to pull us forward, celebrating the goodness of the reality of the resurrection, knowing that your promises hold true, and it's upon those promises that we are established and we live out the life that we live. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. 
Brothers and sisters, we are finishing our series on 1 Corinthians. It's been a journey that we've walked through together. It's a long book with a lot of really interesting and technical aspects to work through. Um, There are some nerdy grammar things that I didn't really get to dig into that could have been fun. There are some controversial aspects of the the text regarding issues that uh, have divided and split congregations over the millennia and uh, but then there's also some areas in this book that have been really great uniting factors that people have read and been encouraged for through a lot of time chapter 16 is one of the lesser known chapters in the book in fact scholars say that there (laughs) um, are probably 10 times more articles and books written on chapter 15 than chapter 16 So it's kind of neat to finish out the book on something not controversial. But as we read chapter 16, I want us to put ourselves in the mindset of how do we close one chapter and move to the next of life. Paul is closing his thoughts. And as he's closing his thoughts, he's trying to tie up the loose ends to encourage people and move them forward. How are we allowing God to move us in times of transition, in times of change, in times of challenge? Right now, a lot of us feel like we've transitioned into being idle, but that's not how we should be viewing this time. It's we should be viewing our current time as transitioning into a time of prayer, a time of sanctification, and a time of regrouping and thinking about mission. And Paul closes this chapter pushing people into a concept of how do you think missionally? So let's read chapter 16 together. Let's jump into this and let's do it. Now about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then, when I arrive, I will give letters of my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost, because a great door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many who oppose me. When Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you, for he is carrying on the work of the Lord just No one then should treat him with contempt. Send him on his way in peace so that he may return return to me. I am expecting him along with the brothers. Now about our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to go to you with the brothers. He was quite unwilling to go now, but he will go when he has the opportunity. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Do everything in love. You know that the household of of Stephanas were the first converts in in Achaia, and they had devoted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to submit to such people and to everyone who joins in the work and labors at it. I was glad when Stephanas, Fortunus, and Achaicus arrived because they have supplied what was lacking from you. For they refreshed my spirit and yours also. Such men deserve recognition." The churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla send you, greet you warmly in the Lord. And so does the church that meets at their house. All the brothers and sisters here send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. If anyone does not love the Lord, let that person be cursed. Come, Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. All right. So inside of that closing, there's some very personal aspects that are very culturally tied to that moment in time where um, we wish we could step inside of that era and actually know these people, these, these personal recommendations. So that way we could be like, okay, Paul, what are you discussing here? It'd be so interesting to be in Macedonia and to be in Achaia, to be in Corinth, to be in Ephesus, and to actually interact with these people, asking them, hey, when you received this letter, what did you think? What did you feel? 
but because we aren't able to fully walk into that moment of time, we're going to have to just rest assured at what the Lord has preserved for us over the millennium. But let's look at verses 1 through 4 real quick, because this is one of the maybe slightly controversial aspects of the text. Um, And thank you for those of you who dealt with a little technical glitch uh, so far. Um, But this is verses 1 through 4 have the more controversial aspect that we might want to look at. Um, But I want to kind of ease people's minds and assure them. He says, Now about the collection of the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, Each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then, when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. We know from the book of Acts and Galatians and Romans that the church in Jerusalem was dealing with a crisis, a crisis where the people didn't have enough food due to a famine. And Paul, because he had the desire to um, support Jerusalem, which would have been really the epicenter of the church, if we remember Pentecost and people having gathered there and then having celebrated uh, Acts 2, Acts 1 and 2, where the full, glorious revealing of the Holy Spirit happened. We know that Jerusalem is kind of the center of the mission of the church. And it's spread from Jerusalem to Judea and then all the way to the ends of the world. And Paul is saying, hey, ends of the world, people. Jerusalem's going through a really, really hard time right now. Let's gather together funds and let's support them so that way the people who started all this don't crash and burn. Let us not forget those who started it all. And because of this, Paul is trying to get a fund collected so that way whenever he visits each church, he can collect that and get it together. Now, interestingly enough, this would have been very, very, very different than how we imagine stuff right now. Um, You and I, if we want to give to a missionary agency, we can just pull up our computer, type in a few things, and we can give. And it's safe and secure. We don't have to worry about that money being stolen. We can also write a check, have it sent, and be very confident that that's going to be fine. But in Paul's day, it would have been coins or jewelry collected, things that were easily exchanged for finances, and he would have gathered it all together. It probably would have been a bunch of sacks and maybe even chests that would have had to have been loaded upon a donkey, a beast of burden, and gone through. Now, Rome had a very beautiful, extensive travel system. Um, Books and books and books have been written about the the pathways and the roads in uh, in the first century and how we saw that these road systems put forth by Rome actually were part of how Christianity spread throughout all the world. This is a beautiful thing. But now, when you and I travel to some location, we will usually drive. It's pretty hard to hold someone up while they're driving. But think about the story of the Good Samaritan, how the man was going on a journey and he was beaten and robbed. If you were walking in the first century carrying the equivalent of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of dollars on a donkey, it would have been obvious. And you would have been putting yourself at risk. Um, And this is where Paul says, I'm going to write letters of approval. Typically, if people knew where finances were coming from and where they're going to, they're more sympathetic to the person that they might rob and actually might not rob them. If they knew that it was an official thing being sent, then they would back off. They didn't want that kind of heat and pressure to be put on them. Think about if someone who is well known is hurt or assaulted, there's more means for that person to uh, put out help and to get all the resources brought back. And justice is usually found in that manner. So that's one aspect of it I think is really cool historically 
But I want to point to how some people want to use this as a means of telling people, hey, every week you need to give a tithe and you need to do so generously. Now, Paul is addressing a special offering at a special time and he's giving the pastoral advice to say, regularly set aside money so that way this isn't one of those oops, I forgot to moments. Now, it's really actually special to think about this passage because one of the areas at Grace Bible Church is we're trying to give to Mission India. And people come in and they give money, they put it into the jug, and then that jug after you know two, three months is sent in. Well, at the end of this month, it's a double giving. So right now, please be sending your checks to Mission India or go to missionindia.org and give to them. And let's not forget to do this. But Paul's not trying to make everybody just always be giving. Paul has set forth in his next book the philosophy of, of giving where he says, hey, look, we are no longer under the law, but people are supposed to give as they are able to, knowing that you know, if you are giving without joy and giving ungenerously, then it reflects a hard attitude. So I could obviously go on and on and on about the spiritual um, truths behind tithing and giving, but I want to just kind of erase from 1 Corinthians 16 the notion of tithing and make sure you guys realize that this is talking about missionary giving and how we do not ever want to forget to give to a global aspect and that also giving is a way to show solidarity. In order for Jerusalem to have received the gift from the other churches, in that culture, receiving a gift of that amount of, of, of finances was saying, I view you as an equal. I view you as a peer. And so as churches, when we give to one another, no matter the amount, we're showing a solidarity. Giving should never be a way of controlling someone else or controlling another church saying, hey, I'm going to give, but here's the strings I'm going to pull. What it needs to be done is a spirit of brotherhood, a spirit of congeniality, a spirit of family saying, let us support one another and push forward your mission. If you are suffering, I'm suffering. Remember, Paul talked about this body dynamics in chapters 12 through 14. If one hurts, the rest of it hurts. If the church in Jerusalem is hurting, the church in Corinth is hurting. Same way, if we in Astoria should say, if the church in Chicago is hurting, if the church in Peoria is hurting, if the church in Rushville is hurting, if the church in Washington, D.C., the church in Sturgis, Michigan, the church in Chennai, India, whatever the location, if they're hurting, so are we because we are linked with them as family in Christ. So that's what Paul's getting at in the giving, is we have to realize that we are giving not as a means of control, not as a means of just having that habit, but as a means of connecting, saying, I love you and I'm showing this in a tangible manner. Giving is never to be done as a means of showmanship, saying, look how much I'm giving versus that person. But giving is supposed to be done in love. But we see this move from there where Paul then says, after I go through Macedonia, where he's collecting the giving, he says, I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you for a while, or even spend the winter there, so that you can help me on my journey, wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord per permits. But I will stay at Ephesus until Pentecost. Because a great door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many more who oppose me. Um, that passage, those verses kind of show a pastoral heart, a missionary heart that Paul has. Paul never wants to be the, I'm coming in, making a big flash, and then moving away. He cared deeply about relationships, which I guess continues on something set forth at the start of the book, where we as Christians are relational in how we, how we compare to one another. So we understand we are deeply rooted in the triune God who is rela relationship eternally, co-equal, loving relationship. So we are acting that out wherever we go as redeemed people. And so whenever we come and we visit with one another, 
We do so out of a desire to really get to know someone, someone who's made in the image of God, who is part of the redemptive work of God in history because they themselves are redeemed. And so Paul's setting forth, th forth this plan. He's setting forth this idea, this concept, this hope that he, he knows is not fully inside of his control. But then it's interesting when he talks about Pentecost, he talks about Ephesus and he says, but I'm going to stay here a little while because there's this great opportunity. Now, the interesting part about that is in Ephesus, that's where he was greatly opposed by the silversmiths. And, you know, he kind of said, hey, uh, Diana's a false god. Y'all should worship Jesus. And he was like, stoned and outcast and riots happened after him. Um, just for those who don't know the historical statement, stoned means having large rocks thrown at his head and being pummeled by objects. That's what that means. Um, so he's fleeing, but he later had to flee Ephesus, but he's saying, hey, this is a great opportunity, meaning the risk that he had personally was outweighed by the fact that he saw hearts hungry for Jesus. But he moves and says, When Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you. For he is carrying on the work of the Lord, just as I am. No one should treat him with contempt. Send him on his way in peace, so that he may return to me. I am expecting him along with the brothers. Now, along with our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to go to you with the brothers. He was quite unwilling to go now, but he will go when he has the opportunity. Now, that right there is a contrast of missions, a contrast of missionaries. Um, Timothy, it, it's kind of sad. He's one of the guys who, in Scripture, he's viewed as being this great um, pastoral heart, someone who understands Scripture, someone who understands the mission of God. He's a person who had had the faith handed down to him from the, his grandmother and his mother. And... Paul loves him dearly. He's like Paul's right-hand man. Yet, Paul has to tell him in First and Second Timothy, don't let anyone look down upon you for your youth, but instead be an example of speech and in thought and purity in the ways of God. And then here in 1 Corinthians, he's like, hey guys, when Timothy comes, don't be jerks to him. It's almost like there's this complete polar opposite because whenever it comes to Apollo, Paul, at the start of the book, was saying, hey, all you people who are trying to jump on the Apollo bandwagon, we're all just servants of the Lord. Don't try to tie yourself to a name. Tie yourself to the Heavenly Father and the redemptive work of Christ and the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. Don't try to tie yourself to a personality. And so Timothy, Paul's right-hand man, he's saying, hey, when he comes through there, don't don't cast him out because he's not like the people that you really want. The Corinthians were people who were, were really, really big on debate and philosophy and heady stuff, the rhetoric. Um, we have proof of this from knowing that that was one of the competitions that happened every other year in Corinth. Um, and Timothy, it looked like, wasn't one of them. But instead, they're like, hey, we want Apollo. We want Apollo. We want Apollo. And Paul's like, hey, Paul, I really wanted him to come. I wanted him to go back and serve you guys, but he, he didn't see it as being the Lord's will to go back to do this. And all this kind of falls back into something that I believe we as, first, as 21st century believers really need to be careful about. When we are listening to someone the Lord, are we actually listening to that person because they are speaking truth? Or are we listening to that person because they are someone who confirms what we want a leader to be, or they're just someone who is charismatic, and as meaning outgoing, and we want to reject those people who seem to confront what we believe should be a leader. And Paul here is saying, hey, look, don't look for a personality. Timothy is someone that I give my apostolic seal of approval to. So he might not be flashy. He might not be the kind of guy that you, you know, oh my goodness, I, I can't wait to listen to what he says next. But you need to pay attention to him. Don't just look for the person that you like. Look 
for the person that is led by God and is following God. We as Christians in the 21st century need to hear that because right now we have access to every single person and every kind of content that we want. And we can end up only listening to what makes us feel good and the kind of people that, hey, that's the preaching style that I like. And we can't do that. We have to listen to those who are approved workmen, rightly dividing the word of truth. And it's interesting from there that Paul then says, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, do everything in love. Paul has verses 13 and 14, which are these punches of imperatives, these punches of commands that he's giving forth and warning to the people in Corinth. Um, this, the statement, be on your guard, it, it appears other times in Scripture. One of the most uh, emphatic instances, I would say, would be in 1 Thessalonians 5, and then the other one would be 1 Peter 5, where it's this concept of saying, hey, look, we as believers recognize that we are standing at a special moment in time, a moment between the resurrection of Jesus and a moment whenever Jesus is coming back to make all things new. And we can't grow um, lazy. We can't kind of sit back and just sort of say, oh, everything's going to happen anyways. We need to be on guard saying, hey, Jesus is going to come back. Therefore, I need to be ready. I need to be vigilant like a soldier who's at a guard post saying, hey, at any moment, something could happen. And if I am lazy, then destruction will be the end result. Be on your guard as believers, knowing that you have to protect your heart and you need to be protecting those around you from instances of calamity. And it goes from there saying, be on guard to stand firm in the faith. So our ability to be on guard is rooted on the substance of what we believe, the substance of what we hold to be true. And in order for us to know what is true, this is something that you have to personally work through. I believe that we find truth first and foremost from Scripture and the Word of God rightly studied in its grammatical context, its historical context, its thought context, its geographic context. And we build off from there saying, what is the meaning? And from the meaning, we work a bridge from what is the 1st century or 8th century B.C. or whatever, bridge to the 21st century, and that's how we get meaning and application. And then we build from there a thought network that we gird around our mind and go from there. Truth. And it's that substance. And so if you're unable to have a faith that is unshakable, then you're not going to be able to stand firm. If you're on a moving surface, you're going to be at risk. Think about how Jesus talked about the house built upon the firm foundation versus the sandy foundation. What is going to shake your faith? If you have a good foundation, you can be assaulted. Your faith can be assaulted and you don't react defensively. But if your result, if your faith is weak, then you're going to respond defensively. Think about how many times in your life someone comes at you and they attack your character, they attack something else, and you react defensively because deep down you know that it's true or you don't have that full depth of assurance. Think about how um, if some of the greatest figures in history could take the most brutal attacks against themselves and their character because they knew what was true and what was not. As Christians, if our faith is rooted in Scripture, if it's rooted in truth, sound thought and reason, then we're going to be able to stand firm and be on guard. And that will cause us then to be able to be courageous and strong. Now, the interesting thing about be courageous, courage is not blind, it's not stupid, but courage is based upon a reality greater than what you're currently Seeing. So it's a difference between um, a perception. We're able to be courageous there um, whenever we are outside of the, pre the moment. Um, we're able to be bigger than what we're currently seeing. David was able to be courageous facing Goliath. 
not because he had killed a bear and a lion, not because he thought he was great with a sling and a stone, but he was able to be courageous because he recognized the superiority of God over that instance. Our courage is never based upon our own self, but it goes back to then the statement of stand firm in your faith. Is your faith rooted in Christ, in the resurrection, and the eternal scope of everything? Or is your faith rooted in something different? Right now, this stay-at-home order is causing a lot of us to be shaken in our faith because what we thought was our personal identity, what we thought was our ability to receive joy or peace, all these things are being shaken and this is the time where I praise God that we're having to actually relook at our faith. We're having to say, what do I believe to hold strong? And therefore have my ability to be courageous looking forward into the future. Your courage is not built upon how big and bad and mighty you are. But it's based upon how awesome, amazing, glorious, and perfect, and caring, and compassionate our Savior is. Which is where that compassionate aspect falls into the final part of this string where he says, be strong, but do everything in love. So as believers, sometimes we think that we're being courageous, we're thinking that we're standing firm, we're thinking that we're having this strength and this being on guard, but we're being complete and total um, words that I can't say as a pastor. And in First Peter, it actually talks about this, where if you're being persecuted for righteousness' sake, you're supposed to stand strong, and you're supposed to realize that this strength comes from a greater reality. But if you're being persecuted because you're just an, an unsufferable person who thinks only of themselves and has to have their own opinion, be what's known and recognized and realized, and you don't listen to others... That's not being persecuted for righteousness' sake. That's not doing things in love. That's doing things for yourself. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul talked about being pa love is patient. Love is kind. Love puts others first. Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. And so think about that. How all of our actions that we might think are these powerful things of being on guard, standing firm, being courageous, and being strong, all of these things if they're not being done in love, Paul said at the start of 1 Corinthians 13, they're like a resounding gong, they're like an empty wind, they're like a bunch of instruments being played without music and without synchronization to one another. But that which is done in love is powerful and actually is mighty. And from there, it's kind of interesting that he puts that square in the middle of saying, Everything he did about his trips to Macedonia, his thoughts about Apollo, and his thoughts about Timothy, he then goes on and says, You know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and they have devoted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to submit to such people and to everyone who joins in the work and labors at it. I was glad when Stephanus, Fortunus, and Achaicus arrived because they have supplied what was lacking from you. For they refreshed my spirit and yours also. Such men, such servants deserve recognition. It's interesting that he had put all these commands that are supposed to be the actions of believers right in the middle of talking about these groups of leaders. And I think that he does this because it's a charge to those leaders. It's a charge and a reminder to those leaders. But also it's a way to kind of get those of us who follow someone else to look at the content and the substance of the character of those that we're following. He said that this is the things that a believer needs to be acting out. And then he says these are people who, have, who are doing it. And those people who are actually living out the faith that we're called to live, you need to listen to them and you need to follow their directives. You need to submit yourself under them. I think about that as an aspect of being a young pastor and how I sit as a leader over a congregation that has men and women who have been following Jesus 
for twice as long as I have been alive. And I need to listen to them. I need to listen to how God has worked in their life and how they have seen him work and how they have submitted to him. So that way I am able to honor, not only just honor them, but I'm able to move forward in my life and leadership based upon what I've seen, known, and heard in them. We need to honor those who have been faithful. We need to honor those who start something good, recognizing that God's work is to be praised and to be honored in their lives. So if you know someone who is a uh, a great encouragement in your faith. Maybe that person who is one of the first people to walk with you, show you the gospel, who caused your eyes to be, to be able to see the truth of Jesus Christ. Have you honored them? I mean, this is the time in the era where uh, we're, we're all on social media. When's the last time you gave honor to someone for their role in your faith on Facebook? You know, it's easy for us to just post things that are self-gratifying and self-glorifying. Things, you know, how far have I ran this week? How many miles have I pushed a stroller? How many cool hoodies do I have? What nice hats? For those of you who don't know, those are all my posts this week on Instagram, and I apologize. Or, look how cute my kids are. How about we move to statements of saying, hey, this person needs to be honored because they love Jesus. Find a way to encourage someone. Find a way to put that out there that others might know how great someone's faith is. Because it's in these solid, demonstrable realities of someone's life that some people are able to watch and see what God has done. And he closes saying, The churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord. And so does the church that meets at their house. All the brothers and sisters here send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write the, this greeting with my own hand. If anyone does not love the Lord, let that person be cursed. Come, Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. So, again, this historic reality of the faith of Priscilla and Aquila is something that he wants to remind people of. They were people of uh, good character and people who used their entire business to support the work of God in both Rome and in Corinth. And Paul's saying, hey, look, remember these people. They greet you, and it actually has an ability to warm the heart and to strengthen the soul and cause people to be able to be courageous and strong because they see the work of God and the grace of God in the remembrance of those people in their name. And he goes from there and says, all the brothers and sisters send you greeting. But then he says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, greet one another with a holy kiss. This is like one of the most joked about verses in Bible schools. Um, this is like the excuse that couples try to make and say, hey, I'm just greeting my significant other with a holy kiss and there's joking about it you know at moody all the guys are like oh i wish we could you know greet you know blah 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 with a holy kiss or whatever these things where you know we, we joke about this stuff where we say oh i'm so glad we don't do that anymore or that had to have been so awkward but i think we in the 21st century have lost a lot of the significance of what this means. And this was actually a radical statement that would have been a slap in the face to a lot of the people in, in, this, in the church of Corinth. Greeting one another with a holy kiss was a proclamation of that person being equal to you and on the same footing. So think about how in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul's like, oh my goodness, you guys are taking the wonderful thing which is reenacting the Last Supper and using it to push your own social agendas to say, I'm rich, look at me, I can do this, and you're actually hurting those who are poor and of lower social status. All throughout this book, Paul's dealing with this socioeconomic crisis and conflict where he's like, look, what are you guys doing? You're equal in Christ. Don't try to just be the people who are bigger, badder, or better, but be the people who recognize the value of one another. And in the first century, greeting someone with a holy kiss 
Greeting someone with a kiss was something that only people did of the same social standing. So you would greet someone who's in the same guild as you or the same fraternal order as you with a kiss on the lips. And then the people who were maybe viewed as not being super low, you greet on the cheek. And then the people that you say are lower than you, you don't kiss. This was a noticeable pecking order by who you pecked on the lips versus on the kiss, versus on the cheek. This was visible. This was seen throughout the marketplace. This was seen in how people interacted with each other. And Paul's saying, hey, greet each other with a holy kiss. You need to demonstrate the value and equality that each other have and one another has by your greetings. Now today we do handshakes, we do occasional hugs, and we've lost a lot of this even inside of this current church, Grace Bible Church, which used to be a church that did have the greeting one another with a holy kiss prior to my time here, um, like five, six pastors ago. It was something that was part of the church tradition here and it dropped out. Um, and we, we walk into hearing scriptures like this and we don't understand the full gravity of what Paul's saying. So I want to challenge you in how you greet one another, in who you greet at church, in who you encourage. Are you just trying to stay inside of certain strata and certain social spheres or are you actually breaking that mold? One of the statements that I find the most egregious to the gospel is whenever people say, you're just the sum of the five people that you hang out with, of your five closest friends. They say, so if you want to be better, be with better people. And I'm like, yeah, that's a very worldly thing to say. Christ says, don't think about social standing. Think about the gospel and the truth of how you are supposed to proclaim that person's worth. And we're never supposed to think, well, I'm better, I'm greater, I'm different, I'm this over someone else. And this hurts. I have been confronted so much in how I've thought about myself and my reality, and I look back at what were the actions and the thoughts that I did in high school and in college and in seminary, and I realize that we as people, I as myself, are very prideful. We want to find ways to distinguish ourselves from someone else, being better than them. And we, I have found whatever way I could. These aren't always visible. These aren't always noticeable. But think about how, how can a church be caring for the mission of God and the work of God of evangelizing the community and making disciples, yet always being composed of the best? We're supposed to always be reaching out. Jesus said he didn't come for, the, a doctor doesn't help the people who are well, but the sick. Jesus didn't come for those who are good, but for the needy. The church should be comprised of those people who have an understanding of our spiritual reality of being sick and needy. And we're supposed to be carrying out that good gospel, saying God came to us when we were still sinners, alienated from him enemies of the cross, yet he died for us that we might have a reconciled relationship with him. And we carry that reconciliation out and about throughout the world. And sometimes it's easier to try to carry about that statement of equality with people that we're never going to see versus the people that we do see that were too doggone prideful to admit that they're just as valuable before God as we are. You know, and... In high school athletics, it's very easy to, um, to say this person's accomplished so much so they shouldn't have to do this. I think about how in high school, cross country and track, um, we needed to get the water cooler from the athletic training room onto the bus before competitions. And how going into my time in high school, it was, well, the freshmen need to carry that on. You need to earn your keep. You need to be able to show humility and do this. And then whenever I became a junior and a senior, I was like, why am I throwing this job onto the freshmen, thinking that there's some sort of lower servant or slave to the greater good of the team? 
You know what needs to happen? That jug needs to get on that bus. And it doesn't matter who does it. And since I'm here, I will carry it. Now, that makes me sound a whole lot less prideful than I was at the time. I think I wanted to be recognized as being a servant and a leader at that time too. So don't, don't give me kudos for that. But what I want to say is this. We have all these weird ways that we work into our life of having social strata that we kind of push someone down to and say, hey, look, you're lower than me. And Paul said, greet one another with a holy kiss. He didn't say greet the people you like with a holy kiss. He didn't say greet the people who look like you with a holy kiss. He didn't say greet the people in the same socioeconomic class as you with a holy kiss. He said greet one another with a holy kiss. Which is interesting because he then goes and says in verse 22, If anyone does not love the Lord, let that person be accursed. Then come, Lord. All this stands in a really weird tension that if you read just straight through it, you might go, what's going on? How can people be saying cur- How can Paul be saying curse people right after he said greet them with a kiss? Pull back. Step back. Think about the context of this. Paul just gave an entire 16-chapter letter all about how the gospel transforms, renews, creates this awesome <laughs> ecclesiology, this structure inside of a city that's supposed to be this outgrowth of love, this place of peace and joy and strength and and encouragement. And he's saying, if someone wants to have all of this yet deny Jesus, then that person is substantially flipping everything on its face. It's the same, and you can't, they want to have their cake and eat it too. But he's saying, no, look, if someone wants to, rec- to enjoy the blessings of being part of a community, they have to be rooted inside of the core essence of that community, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ as a church. Now, this is not Paul going around saying, go find the people who don't love Jesus and curse them. Because Paul, if you remember, says, I was the, I'm the least of all the apostles because I was a persecutor of the church. I was the one who went around trying to kill the followers of Jesus. What he's saying is we have to recognize that those who don't love Jesus need to know Jesus. We can't kind of pitter-patter around that point. We need to proclaim Jesus. And then he says, come, Lord. Paul's crying out the cry of a lot of our hearts right now, where we want things to be made better and be made new. It's interesting, cursing next to come, Lord, is sort of this reality that we live in right now. So the overarching story of Scripture is there's the creation of everything good, then the fall, where the curse of sin just brought everything down. Creation, fall, and everyone's living inside of this curse of sin. And then there's the redemption that comes as foreshadowed through the law and the prophets and realized in Jesus Christ. Redemption, this this reconciled relationship with God that is able to be had, being bought back from sin and the slavery of that to being one who's declared righteous and one of God to restoration of all things. Right here, we have Paul, words next to each other saying, hey, this is the reality, that there's those people who hate Christ and there's the reality that we need God to come back. And that's kind of, a, I guess, a good summation of this entire book as we're living inside of this tension, this tension that we're supposed to be a people who, are, who call upon the name of Jesus Christ and live out his truth in this world, yet we see that we don't act out as we should. Instead, we are acting out in sin. And we should be reaching out in love to our neighbor, yet we're often trying to ask why. There's this tension. But instead, we should focus on who is Jesus? Are we living out his reality in this world? Are we understanding the depth to which he saved us? And allowing that to fuel our worship for him and our desire to keep the mission of God moving forward. 
It's what kept Paul moving from one place to another. It's what kept Paul going from one place where he was stoned and beaten to another place where he was stoned and beaten. That's what moved Paul from being shipwrecked to going and being shipwrecked. And you, you know, read all of this. We see how necessary our understanding of the gospel is. It shapes how we view ourselves. It shapes how we view others. And it causes us to be more on mission, which is where now the concrete way that we can live this out is email one another, text one another, call one another, Zoom with one another, Facebook video message with one another, write a letter, encourage people. There are people who need help. There are people who cannot afford to buy groceries. And are we aware even of that? of who needs the help and who needs the strengthening? Are we sending resources to people that need the resources? Are we allowing ourselves to be shaped by the gospel and acting that out? Um, I'm going to be preaching through Luke chapter 6. At least that's my plan so far. I'll post on Facebook this week what the next few sermons are scheduled to be and read through that. It gives concrete ways to live out the, um, the push of this gospel that Paul preaches. And I want us to always be in prayer, always desiring to love one another, so that way we can show people just how great Jesus is. Because he's great, he's awesome, he's mighty, and he's powerful. We are humbled to be able to serve him. So I'm going to close this in a word of prayer. And um, I just ask that all of you would go forth today strengthened by Jesus Christ submitting to him, and living in <laughs> accordance to the Holy Spirit and the commands of the Heavenly Father. Thank you, God, for being so wonderful, being so good and so great. We ask that we would be people who turn our eyes to you, people who try to find ways to keep the mission of the gospel of Jesus Christ moving forward in this world. Give us ways to love one another. Keep us safe. Keep us humble. Keep us always loving you. Let us show other people how great you are by loving them. Keep us from being prideful and viewing ourselves as better than anyone else. It's such an easy trap to fall into, Lord. Let us not do that. I also pray right now for everyone, again, who is in the educational system in the state of Illinois and the other states where we've shut down for the year. I ask that you'd help these teachers to have closure with their students, help them to be able to... Um, figure out just this online world. I, I pray for all the seniors who are um, just missing a good closing chapter in their life. Give them comfort and, and solace knowing that you are still good, you're still here, you're still available, and help us as your church to be the hands and feet encouraging those who are mourning, knowing that your scriptures call us to mourn with those who mourn. We love you, God, and I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.